with each other, and then you can have a seat. God bless you.
just going to quote it for you to give you an understanding how people are wondering what difference does it all make anyway. Here's what Kurt Vonnegut said in Cat's Cradle, One Big Muddy Mess of a Mistake. In the beginning, God created the earth, and he looked upon it in his cosmic loneliness. And God said, let us make living creatures out of mud. And so the mud can see what we have done. Are you picking up on the cynicism yet? And God created every living creature that now moveth, and one was man. And mud as man alone could speak. God leaned close to mud as man sat, looked around, and spoke. What is the purpose of all this? He asked politely. Everything must have a purpose? Asked God. Certainly, said man. Then I leave it to you to think of one for all this, said God, and he went away. That was Kurt Vonnegut's idea of God. That somehow, as a big cosmic joke, he made you and me. That he made mankind, and then he just went off into the cosmic loneliness just to see how we would work things out. I'm going to tell you something, you guys. That, in contrast to the story of Easter, could not be more different. Because our God is everything but away from us and gone from us. Our God did not create us and leave us alone and just hope we can work things out. Because I will promise you one thing. He already knows this. We make a big money message. We do anyway. But God created us with a purpose. He created you with a special purpose. You say, me? I haven't figured it out yet, but God knows your purpose. God knows exactly why you're here on this earth. And today I just hope to have your attention just for a few minutes and help you understand why you're here and what difference Easter makes. In 1 Corinthians 5, 2, it says this. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Listen, you guys. The Bible, do you know what the word gospel means? Transliterated, you know what it means? Good news. How many of you could use some good news today? Anybody? How many of you turn on the, on the TV and just looking for some good news? There isn't any. Because it basically reveals our sin, our, our desperation, the mess we make as humans of this life God has given us. But the Bible says that there is good news for you today. Have you discovered this good news? Well, we're going to just take one verse in the Bible today, and I think it's probably the most popular New Testament verse. Can you imagine which one it is? Who, who thinks they can guess? Go ahead. What's the most popular of John 316. It's one of the mo most simple verses in the Bible, and probably the most profound. And here's, here's the way it goes. For God loved the world so much that he, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Is it on the screen behind me? Can we read that together? Let's start with the caption. Ready? John 3.16. For God loved the world so much. That he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Today I just wanted, I just wanted to share with you four simple things that can help you know for sure what difference Easter makes for you. Okay? Here's number one. Here's what you need to do. Acknowledge God's great love. Some of you don't feel lovely. And you don't feel lovable. How do I know this? You know, our, our institutions are packed with people in depression. Now, sometimes depression is of a chemical nature. It needs to be treated. And if somebody has chemical depression, we're not going to ever say, don't get treated. But do you know that many times depression comes from people feeling lonely, unworthy, guilty, Depression oftentimes comes from the sense that people don't have any hope. 
And I want to tell you today, you've got all the hope in the world because of the first part of John 3.16. It says, for God loved the world so much. For some people, it's easy for them to believe that God loves the world, but they just have trouble believing God loves them. I remember when I was first a youth pastor 40 years ago. Oh, my word, how did that happen? And there was a girl in my youth group, and one day she tried to commit suicide. And, and that's always such, such a tragedy, isn't it, for young people, especially teenagers, to feel so hopeless that they commit suicide. And she was spared from the suicide, but as I got to talking to her after this attempted suicide, I said, can you share with me why? She said, because God doesn't love me. And, and I said, well, the Bible says God loves you. And she said, well, God loves everybody else, but he doesn't love me. And I don't know what, why it came out of me this way, but I said, I said, Betty, what makes you so special? What makes you so special? And she said, what? I just told you that I'm not special. I said, no, you just told me you're the only person on earth that God can't love. You must think you're pretty special. She said, no, I think just the opposite. I said, then put that down and understand and believe that God says he loves you. He loves you. Boy, she started to cry. And she started to weep. And within a few minutes, she had prayed and received Jesus as her Savior. She began to get that hope that God was telling the truth, that she was important. Are you understanding today how important you are to God? God loves you. You know, Jesus said God loves you so much that every hair of your head is numbered. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Take a guess. How many hairs do you think you have? Some of you men need to guess again because you guys have a couple seconds, you know, you lost a few more, right? They're just, they're just falling away. But listen, God knows you intimately. He cares about every single thing in your life. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says this. Look at this, what this says. It says, God showed you how much he loved us by sending one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away from our sin. Listen, before you can ever become anything, you've got to have a sense that you belong to something. That you belong to a family. That you belong. That young girl that I was talking with didn't feel that she belonged anywhere. She felt unimportant and unaccepted. But then she understood Jesus Christ loves her and wants her to belong to his forever family. How important is this, you guys? Listen, Jesus loved you way too much to want to spend eternity without you. He went to the cross and paid for your sins so that your sins could be forgiven, removing the wall between you and God that's a barrier that will eternally keep you separated from him. But Jesus paid the price. He went to the cross and paid for everything that you and I have ever done wrong. You know that secret sin that just plagues you and you, you think, man, if, man, if anybody ever knew, they just think I'm the worst person in the world. Maybe you don't have one of those sins, but most people do. And you're thinking, man, I just don't know if God could ever forgive me. But Jesus said he came and died for you because he wants you to belong to him. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, see, that I love this verse. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that's what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. You see, he wants you to know him and know how much he loves you. Here's the second thing. Appreciate God's great gift. Oh, man. Was Christ's death on the cross and burial and resurrection a gift? The greatest gift of all. 
In Romans 5, 6, it explains that part of John 3, 16, the second part, that he gave his one and only son. Look what it says. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. You know, we men, we, we like to not, not be helpless. I don't know about the women. I'm not a woman. By the way, Annie, I don't know if I need to come to your seminar because I don't have a purse in my car. Unless it's a glorious purse. But I think it's about other things, right? But we men, we, we want to have our stamina and prowess. We, we want to be in control. And you know a lot of people want to be in control so much that they can't admit that they're weak. I remember a day when I turned 16 years old, about two weeks later, maybe three, that I finally could admit that I needed a Savior. I finally admitted, and I was a religious kid. I mean, I was playing both sides. I knew the lingo, the language, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and then curse with my next breath. I was rebellious in my heart towards God, and I thought I could go it on my own. But one night, Jesus convicted me, and I began to realize that I needed a Savior. And listen, His gift is so great, I had to realize that I'm utterly helpless without Him. I can't earn my own salvation. I can't get myself pure and cleaned up and go to heaven on my own. None of us can. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I want to explain to you what was going on on the cross. Just briefly today, I want you to really understand this. Now today is not as much about the cross as it is the tomb that was empty. But you still have to understand what Jesus went through on Good Friday to celebrate what happened on Easter Sunday. Do you know that when Jesus hung on the cross, now this is my dad's Bible. I, I cherish this Bible. Uh, my dad preached from this Bible. But let's pretend for a moment that this is not the Bible, but is a book. And this book contains all the sins written down that I have ever committed in my life. Has anybody ever committed a sin? I saw one hand go up. Everybody else was like, ah. uh, The question is how many sins? I want you to imagine for just a moment, because this is a book, you know, the Bible says that every single trespass and sin that we commit is written in a book of judgment against us that God is keeping. That ought to scare the liver out of you guys. I mean, especially some of you. I know some of you. I know me when I look in the mirror. That would scare me to death. I mean, I can't even, I can't even sin a little <coughs> sin in my mind, a little sin without God writing it down. Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine just for a second the importance of this gift. Now, I try to imagine that you had three speeding tickets every day of your life for 90 years. Well, let's take out 20 of those years and say from the time you're 20 to the time you're 90, 70 years. Let's round it up at about a, a three speeding tickets a day, three traffic violations a day, and there's about approximately a thousand a year. But let, let's just make it round into a thousand a year. And at the end of this time, you have to stand before a traffic court judge, and the traffic court judge opens the book and says, Mr. Welch, this book we had to get more books because there are 90,000 traffic violations against you. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think, do you think that judge would be a just judge if he just said, Adam, ah, don't worry about it? Do you think he'd be a just in, in, in takers on it? Is he just if he ignores what you've done? No. 
Oh, well, can you guys see a little interaction? <laughs> I, I know you think there's a test or something and you're going to pass or fail, but just take it at face value. No. You say, no, he would not be just. He's not a good judge if he doesn't throw the book at you. How many of you want somebody out there with 90,000 traffic violations against them driving around? I know they exist because I live in Sun City. <laughs>
What would be your answer? Oh, I've done good things and never, never killed people. I've never done bad things. How good do you have to be to get rid of those 70,000 traffic violations? But Jesus Christ took care of them for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Yes, the greatness of the gift. Appreciate it. Third, accept God's great offer. Oh, God is making you an offer today. If you've never received this offer and said yes to it, take it. Have you ever watched a little child that's maybe one with a Christmas gift? They never get to the gift. The bow is enough for them. But inside the box is the gift. And so many people at Easter, they've settled for the bow. The Easter eggs, the fun, you know, the Easter bunny. But they've never opened the gift and taken it and received it for themselves. You've got to accept God's great offer today to make this the best time you've ever had. What's the third part of John 3.16? So that everyone who believes in him Who's it for? Everyone. Salvation is intended for everyone. But you've got to unwrap it and receive it. And you can't just mix it in either. I had a neighbor up in Elmhurst Hills years ago. And I was talking to him about my faith. And I was sharing this. I think I shared this a few weeks ago here. And uh, he said, well, I make it up as I, I have my own religion. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of take some of this, some of that. Put it all in there and mix it all up. And it's kind of like, what do you got? Vitamix and you come out and <laughs> fake a milkshake or something? I mean, what is it? No. This guy had it wrong. And I said, what if you're wrong? I said, if I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. But what if you're wrong? What if you ignore God's great gift of salvation in Jesus Christ? The Bible says that there is no other name given under heaven by which people must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one who isn't in the grave anymore. When he resurrected from the grave, he proved that everything he promised could be ours, including the forgiveness of sins, belonging to God's forever family, and having the resurrection of our own bodies someday in heaven. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has been revealed, Bringing salvation to all people. God says he doesn't want anyone to perish. But he wants everyone to come to repentance and know Jesus Christ. In Romans 3.22, here's what it says we do. And how we're made right with God. This is so good. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? People are always saying, how can I be made right with God? Can I do some, some other nice things, send some money somewhere, do some nice works? No, according to Ephesians, that's not enough. But it says here, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Do you my little friend Benny? That was the only person God couldn't love. You may be like her. You may be thinking, well, it's too late for me. I'm too wicked. I've done too many bad things. God could never do it for me. But the word of God that's always true says, no matter who you are. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, for God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Instead of, it's indeed, rather, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. I want you to imagine this. Could one of you help me bring two chairs up? Would you mind just grab, just put one here, maybe one here, if you wouldn't mind. There's a Bible on one of you. You can pass that to my mother-in-law, Jerry. But uh, just, just do that. Put this chair here, put this chair here. I'm going to ask that question again. Now listen, you guys, this is a little different message for Easter, right? Usually there's a 
20 minute homily, and then you know we all celebrate the resurrection. But this today is for you. I want to ask you a serious question today. It's that important if you're watching online. I want you to also think about this illustration and answer this question for yourself. Remember a few minutes ago I said, if God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? What would be your answer to him? Now, I want you to think realistically about that without buying into the cliff notes that I've already shared. What would you say to God? Well, I'm religious. You know, I, I grew up in this religion. I, I go to church. I do, I do the thing. I, I, I do what God says, you know, in the Bible. I do all that stuff. I do that. I haven't done bad things. I've never killed anybody. I followed the Ten Commandments. You made liar, you just broke one of them. But but I don't but I'm not I'm not as bad as the other guy. There's a lot of people worse than me out there. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. When I get to heaven, I hope that that scale leans towards good rather than bad for me. Let me ask you a question. If you answered that question that way, who is the only person you talked about? Yourself. Yourself. You see, God says there's no scale because we all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We've got those 70,000 plus sins against us. But Jesus paid for your sin and the word of God says you either get the choice of having yourself as your Savior or Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who do you think you can trust to forgive all of your sins? Yourself or Jesus Christ. And so I want you to imagine just for a moment as we're getting ready to close. This chair represents whatever you've trusted in so far for salvation. All the good things you've done, your religion. Uh, you're sitting in this chair hoping that when you die, just hoping when you die, you've done enough to get to go to heaven. But God says your righteousness is like filthy rags in his sight. But Jesus Christ, who rose from the grave, offers you a different chair today. He offers you to get up and place your faith, not just in what he did, but on his offer to receive eternal life. I'm going to give you a chance to do that today, in just a minute. Thank you for help with the illustration. You can just leave those sit there for people to stare at them and <laughs> For this to work for you, you've got to anticipate God's great future and you've got to receive it because God says if you make this choice, you will not perish, but you'll have eternal life. You'll have eternal life. Francois Rabelais, in the 15th century, he was a French humanist. He was an atheist, an early atheist. And on his deathbed, people gathered around him. And they said, Francois, are you at peace? What's going to happen now with you dying? And he says, I die and I go to seek the great perhaps. Listen, if you're trusting in this chair, that's all you have is a great perhaps. But if you trust in Jesus Christ, you have the great for sure. You have your sins forgiven. You have eternal life. God's spirit to live in you once you receive Jesus and help you follow him and learn to trust him more and more. In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Remember the Christmas story 
Who were the first people that God proclaimed to that Jesus had been born? Do you remember? Who did the angels come to visit in a Christmas story and proclaim? We say with singing, but definitely with great proclamation that Jesus had been born. Who were they? Shepherds. Shepherds. The lowest of the low on the totem pole of men on earth were shepherds. They were untouchable. They were filthy. They were people of the earth. Looked down upon by higher people on earth. But God chose them. Guess who he chose to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ to first? Mary Magdalene. First of all, her name was Mary. She was a woman. In that day, it meant that she was lower than even the shepherds. <coughs> she had no rights and privileges as a woman. In that day and age, now I didn't make this rule up, so don't blame me. Don't get angry at me for reporting it. But who did Jesus reveal his resurrection to first? It wasn't a shepherd, even it was somebody that society even saw lower. Not only was Mary Magdalene a woman, but she had been a prostitute. A prostitute who was worthy of being stoned under the Jewish law for being a prostitute. Not only that, the Bible reports that she had been filled with seven demons. She was a demon-possessed woman who had to be, and Jesus cast the demons out on her. This is who Mary Magdalene was, and who did he come to first when he was resurrected? She went to the tomb. The Bible says in John 20, she went to the tomb and found it empty, and her only thought was, somebody has stolen his body. Who would do this? What did they want to do with his body? She ran back and told Peter and John that the body was gone. She followed them back to the tomb. They went in, in the Bible says they saw his grave clothes in an empty tomb, and they believed because they remembered the proclamation. He had said, I'm going to come back again the third day. But as she was weeping outside the tomb, and she was thinking of all Jesus had done for her, and all the sins that he had forgiven, and how he had given her a new life, and she's weeping, and all of a sudden, somebody appears to her and says, why are you weeping, woman? And she says, they've taken the body of my Savior. I don't know where, what they've done with it. And all of a sudden, he revealed that it was Jesus. And she rejoiced. In a way you can't even understand. That he was alive again. Why? Because every promise he made was now going to be true. And I want you to think about who it was that God revealed first. Because there's something powerful in that message, my friend. It means no matter who you are, who you are, what you've done, you can be forgiven, set free, and given the promise of eternal life. Forgiveness of all your sins. And you too can have purpose in Easter. In the same passage, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, but in the message version, I love how it says, just as we close, what a God we have, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life, and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and the future starts now. You may be saying, Pastor Mark, okay, I can recognize I'm a sinner. I've committed those sins. I feel my heart pounding. God's speaking to me right now. But what do I need to do about it? The Word of God says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. I'm going to invite you right now in your prayer, you know, as an act of faith, to move from this chair, whatever it is for you, over to the seat of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you that you were not willing to let anything perish in me, body, soul, or spirit. Your 
death, burial, and resurrection were so complete that through your death, sins could be forgiven. But through your resurrection, the body is promised to even be resurrected as a purified eternal body one day. You thoroughly destroyed the works of the devil when you died and rose again. Jesus, I believe in you today. You, if you want this in your life and you've never received Jesus, pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe in you today. I believe that you died for me on the cross and paid for my sins. I believe, Jesus, you rose again from the dead. And that now you offer me true assurance that I'm saved and going to heaven when I die. Jesus, I'm ready to move from my chair of self-dependence or religion over to your promise of forgiveness and eternal life. And I'm getting up from my own chair and placing myself right now through faith in what you've done alone for me. Thank you for coming into my life right now. I sense that you're doing something very important and special for me right now. I receive it. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. Help me to learn to follow you from this day forward. Thank you for eternal life that I receive right now. It begins today. And thank you for forgiving me in Jesus' name. We're not looking around yet. We're not quite done with that spirit of prayer, but as your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I'm going to ask that if you just pray that prayer and receive Jesus, that you do two things. First of all, let me know with an upraised hand. Would you do that? If you just prayed that prayer today and invited Jesus in as your Savior, raise your hand and just look up at me and let me know. Anyone in the house? God be with both of you. Yes, another. Yes, God is doing great work today. Anyone else receiving Jesus today and just say, Oh, God is good. God is good. Jesus, thank you for these that pass from death to life and now have an understanding of their eternal life through you, Jesus. Be with them now. Walk with them. And we celebrate eternal life given to us by Jesus. Thank you. Amen.